close to the wind. Young, I'm not yet grown into the way of hawk. Three gapes open in not knowing. Blood instinct under their tongues. Their yellow claw fingers grasp air, itch for rabbit neck. They have been named in the old language, as if that charm would keep them through all odds. Named ghost, light, sky, to breathe height into their wings. Been braceleted with numbers to count the days of their passage, the days of their deaths. And they will be launched forth, pushed into air as seal into water, into unarmored air that offers no refuge, into the sights of shotguns. The Harriers harried, brought low with lead, leaving their plotted tracks to those who collect knowledge no legacy to their own kind, thrust in their turn into the spring breeze on the Carnethi. None except an impression of tail feather dipping into cloud, an almost call at the edge of hearing. Awir, Goli, a spread, Sky, light, ghost. It's not only birds in captivity. Intelligent mammals are kept in captivity too. Dolphins, I'm thinking of. Flipper is what they call him. The land ones who find fish in air, swim clumsily with the smell of fear in this spoilt water. He doesn't know this as name, knows only the sound his mother made through the living water when she spoke him. He still tries to speak her, but this place is an echo with no answers. He swims round and round through the tight days. Dead fish, dead water, shouts like hunting from the fish throwers. Once there was a female not his mother. She smelt of wrong body, of tired. She sank to the bottom, stopped seeking air. He wants to stay at the bottom, not to surface into sharp light, sounds that hurt his cavities, to let his lungs fill with the killed water. He tries, but something in him drags him up. When he leaps, he sees an echo of himself in the wall of solid air. One day, he takes his largest leap into echo, into stopping head thrust forward. One flipper raised. Mm. And yes, that's right. Captive dolphins do commit suicide. It has been known. Now, I know that uh, many of these poems are very dark and I make no apology for that. These things are, are serious 
and we need to confront them. But there is joy and there is love too. Love lies largely where you find it. And it is what a tree does, lifting its face to the sun, having invented solar panels. And it is what a tree does, puffing out warning to its neighbours of beetle attack, aphid attack. And it is what a tree does, pumping sugar to its dying neighbour, root to root. And it is what a bird does, scavenging in snow bare patches to fill insistent gapes. And it is what I do, stacking logs, stoking the hearth to comfort the chaste and injured thing that curls there, shivering. Mm. And whether it's trees or humans, perhaps it's about that aspect of what I call the other, that we struggle to find words for, that that's something more inside us all that we might call spiritual. This next poem, the last in this set, is... Um, is called Psalm and it was inspired by John Coltrane's music, A Love Supreme. We mouth them on repeat until they're full and empty as mantras. Ah, please God, and ah, hallelujah, I love you and why me? The worn out currency of words stretched beyond their definitions by volcanoes which possess us burst out in utter lava that grows cold on blistered lips. We sang before we spoke and some rare souls find deeper language, first offspring of the primal cry. Tonight, it's Coltrane's saxophone that tells it how it is, how life goes on under the bruises, then reaches for the sky to seek one last and everlasting listener. Over the rolling grumble of the world's drums, it speaks me. When river gets within a breath of sea, with thrust of current, matches push of tide where silt has settled tough pioneers glasswood and cord grass set up camp are joined by other species that live on the edge sea lavender sea aster thrift not a place for the unwary. They step here at their risk, crisscrossed with creeks, studded with island tussocks, haunted with left behind voices of departed geese. A muted landscape, caught in shades of dawn, before the suns got up and raised a smile. Best to have wings for aerial scan of salt pan and scrape for the quick getaway made for transience this patch 
butterflies in October, the lazy lapwing flocks. No place for maps. The marsh rewrites itself with every season, every wash of tide. Nothing stays long. Banks shift. The river rises year on year. This is a place in transit. Going. Gone. Power play on the coastal line. This was the Everest of waves. A titan teenager bursting with tantrum, biting at the red, red cliff, snatching at bushes, fences, snapping signal poles like matches, picking up train and track and throwing them in the air and out of the game. We'd wait it out, we said. Retreat to what surely must be a safe distance. Gather what random toys it had hurled back at us. Thankful we still had electric power. Maybe the water brat had views on power. What we'd worked done when we'd had the chance. Brewed up a righteous rage. Maybe the storm hiss was its laughter as it put us in our place. I'll show you power. It did. Then, as we started to pick up, put back, we found it had invited all its friends. This is how it will be. After scrabble and grab, after beg and dwindle, after pox and puke. These hollow streets, half shadowed with haunts. These house shells clustered, glowing with empty. The hole across the bay they called Hinkley. This is how it will be, after fire and flood, after parch and mildew, after starve and stab. These scaffold trees crumbling to char, these clots of fur and feather, fences leaning slant, still guarding bones and empty sockets. This is how it will be after babble and bleed, after greed and grime, after the pennies drop. This demented sun smearing the tired grasp of a smothered sea, which heaves its plastic trawl. This deafened air, this deafened air. This is how it will be. Thank you. Would anybody like to ask a question? I have a couple of things to ask uh, Jenny if, if nobody else wants to start. So I, I will start. Um, the book is called Signals from the Other. Now you did quite, you did touch on what the, that other is, um, but perhaps 
Would you like to describe it in a bit more detail? You did mention that it's the spiritual thing inside us, but what else would you say about it? Well, I'm very aware that we live in a, a, a very human centric world. And to me, the other is all the other life forms in the world that um, we ignore, we don't listen to. We only listen by and large to other humans. And I think it's time that people listened to the non-human, whether that's the animals, the plants, the whole ecology and, um, and paid some more attention to the earth is screaming and um, we need to listen to it. And as well, that links for me, that very much links with the spiritual side. Um, that's uh, what I find when I listen within. That is both me and a lot more than me. Yes, and of course, living in uh, the lovely West Country, you must become very aware of the importance of of listening to to nature, for, to call it by its old fashioned name. Um, so um, how did this book ev evolve? How did you go about collecting, deciding which poems should go in? Um, did you set out to write it or did you just have a lot of poems and you discovered the theme within the poems? As I became increasingly um, more concerned about environmental um, issues and more active in different ways, that started to creep into my poetry and I realised that I was writing more and more poems that were um, put, giving a voice to different aspects of the natural world and that that was going to be the shape of my next book. So, um, yeah. So did you actually write, specifically write any, any of the poems that are in the book now? Were any of them written after you decided that, or were they all yes. there? No, some go back quite a long way because they just didn't fit with, uh, with earlier books, but there were quite a few that were written um, within the last year, say, um, that I was writing very much with the book in mind. And in fact, the title poem, it's very, very rare that I do this, but I actually, um, chose the title for the book and then wrote the poem oh, to yeah. go with it. And I really didn't think it would work, but I think it does, so. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed when, when I set about setting the book in printed form, because um, there, there's the layout, oh, I don't know if you can see the layout oh, of some of the know. books. They, there are an enormous number of different styles of, of uh, lineation, I would say, um, particularly. I don't know that the style of your, your uh, voice changes a great deal. I think you're very consistent there. But the actual um, shape of the poems is very, very varied indeed. There are some perfectly uh, straightforward sort of four, four line in a stanza. And there are some which are very scattered about the page. Um, what would you say about that? Well, I find that the poem finds its own form. I, I on the whole, I try not to impose a poem, form on a poem. Um, and so some fall naturally into a pattern of stanzas um, whereas others, yeah, they seem to, to want to be in a particular shape and the scattered poems in particular are all where I've been, I've been writing about, about topics that, that, that were in themselves, um, uneasy and fragmented and slippery that I, that you couldn't really get a grip on them. And the only way I could write into them was in fragments. Um, the, things like um, the fossil coast or, or the um, um, 
I'm trying to think which other ones, but, the, but there are several that that my feeling about the um, that occasion or or that topic was that it was just so fragmented. That was the only way I could express it. And others such as the the, um, the dolphin poem, where at the, it's it's fairly conventional until you get to the very end, when I'm expressing in the in the shape of it exactly what the dolphin is doing. Yes, that's right. Um, Crow Place is one where you've got, I don't know if anyone can see, if, if people have their own book there, it's page 58. Um, and Crow, Crow Place has a lot of large spaces in the middle of lines. Is that to help you to read them properly? The lines? Um, I don't think I thought of it that way. I think it's a f feeling of it being very more different voices perhaps coming from this place mm. um, mm. rather than than it being one coherent voice it's the place with its multiples of of inhabitants speaking mm. yes Saunton Sands which you mentioned is is very scattered yes. and I could see why because it's a sort of shifting landscape isn't it yeah so you're almost painting a picture on the page of a spread out grains of sand almost. Yes, it's interesting. So has anybody else got any questions or comments? You can just just burst in if you like. I'm very bad at looking at the chat. <coughs> Yes, there is chat. A chat. People have been commenting. That's great. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering. I know I'm talking about the the cover again, but <laughs> it's. Um, I wondered why you chose that image because it's such a, a co. It, it's such a cozy outer edge exterior for things that are very sort of brittle and edgy on the inside and I wondered what made you choose that image yeah I don't think of it as cozy that's interesting because ah, okay. um, that, <laughs> okay, that's... Um, I a friend of mine is a textile artist mm. and um, I was looking at her, some of her textiles and I saw saw this one and I just felt that the sort of otherness of it and the mixture of colors mm. I felt oh that 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 speaks to me of my book I felt mm. that any actual natural images would be much too specific mm. and so I needed something that was quite abstract and other than than the the actual things I was writing about um, and so it was just really a gut feeling that yes that mm. that's that would fit. It's 